There we go. Oh, let me take this off. All right, we're all good? In the booth, you guys good to go? 
All right, I see it. Welcome, welcome. I'm so glad to see everyone. Welcome uh, to the Military Women's Memorial. I'm Matt Leifer. I'm our Director of Visitor Experience and Programs here. My pronouns are he and him. October is LGBTQ History Month, and I'm excited to bring you today's program, Breaking the Silence 10 Years After Don't Ask, Don't Tell. For this program, we are proud to partner with the Modern Military Association of America. They are the nation's largest organization of LGBTQ service members, military spouses, veterans, their families, and allies. We are honored today to have their CEO and executive director, Jennifer Dane, with us uh, to lead our discussion. Jennifer is a veteran of the United States Air Force who has served as an intelligence analyst focused on geopolitical relations, terrorism, and threat vulnerability issues. In addition to being the executive director, she currently serves as a founding board member of Partners in Promise and is a VET Policy Fellow. She uh, has an educational background in criminal justice, education, and public policy, and diversity and inclusion. She's currently a public policy and so social change PhD student at Union Institute and University. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Thank you so much. There you go. And I'm going to turn it over to you to, to introduce our, our guest as well. Well, I'm so excited to be here, and thank you for the Women's Memorial for uh, letting us be here today. But um, I'm going to introduce probably one of my, I want to say, hero, because I don't know what other word to use, an icon in, our, in the military, definitely, uh, Major General Smith. She served for 35 years in the Army, um, doing so many things, anywhere from Costa Rica to, was it I, Iraq, is that correct? Or Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Um, I looked at your bio. It was amazing. You were in ROTC. That's where you started out, um, which is University of Oregon. Is that right? is that correct? Go Ducks. Yes. And uh, I read that they are one of the number one producers of flag officers, and you were the first one out of there. So that was pretty interesting. I also know that uh, you know your background. You have a doctorate as well in management, and then. Um, a little birdie told me that you're really interested in peeps, um, and you just completed bartending school, which I'm so excited. So I'm so excited to be here with you, and um, it's just really exciting. I, I know that whenever I was an airman, uh, just a little airman, I remember looking up to you, and uh, it's just an honor to sit next to you today, for sure. Well, thanks for being here for the discussion, and I'll just add my thanks also not only to you, but to the Women's Memorial for Absolutely. hosting this discussion. Yes, absolutely. And I, I don't know if we had, I'll go ahead and start with our questions. But um, so really wanted to know, what, is it, what was it like to be in the military, obviously serving, you know, from 86 to 2010, you, you've served, you know, a gamut of, you know, not only social change in the military, but public policy change um, in hiding and also openly. And um, what was that like for you? You know, it's, um, it's the longevity that I think about now, the 35 years, and that was just of my commission time, and prior to that as an ROTC cadet. So sometimes I feel like I've got this special view of having gone through 35 years and this understanding that change is iterative, but it moves in the right direction. You know, just in terms of the question of like, what was it like? Um, you know, I got that ROTC scholarship in the early 80s. And in the early 80s, if we remember our timeline, it was only in 1980 that the first class of women that they graduated from a service academy. So I was entering the military at a time when not only a, a difficult time, we'll say, for people who identified in the LGBT community, um, but, you know, it was actually a continuation of a difficult time for women in the military who had always served well, had the Women's Army Corps, and they had always served well. But now we're entering into another phase where they are opening up more opportunities to women, and so there's a little resistance of that, too, at about the time I came in. I like to point out what's unique to my timeline is that prior to about 1982, when I started in ROTC, there was a, it was criminal in the military to be identified as a homosexual. And so it was criminal. And it, when you were caught or found out, you were discharged as a criminal offense. And 
what changed in 19, um, about 82, it was for the first time the Department of Defense put a policy into the place that said um, it wasn't so much the homosexual act, it was who you were, your identification, your just your mere existence was such a horrible thing to unit morale and cohesion um, that your mere existence was enough to do that we couldn't have you in the military. So, you know, I came into the military during the time of a ramp up of visibility of how horrible people who were identified as LGBT were, and I don't even think we considered the T at, at that time. Um, but I, my entry into the training environment and as a lieutenant was, you know, on that. It's like the, the women are making some ways, let's push back on that. But also, too, we've now got this policy uh, that says that your mere existence is so horrible that we can't possibly have you around um, other military members. Yeah, and it was so true. I mean, we look now at, you know, we're talking about 82 and then go to 93, and you're serving, you're an, you're an officer, a young officer um, at that, and you know the policy comes out. Well, in 1992, if anybody knows uh, a Navy seaman named Alan Sch uh, Schindler, Jr. was uh, on the dock, his ship docked on the coast of Japan, and he was brutally murdered by two of his shipmates for posting a communication that said, too cute to be straight, and basically adding himself. And so because of that, in 1993, the compromise happened with Bill Clinton um, in Congress to say, you know, we're not going to ask you, we're, you don't have to tell us. Um, and we know really that that, didn't, that wasn't the case. So for you, you know, in 1993, when this policy actually got put back into place formally now that, you know, you really couldn't tell, you, you, they really couldn't ask or you really couldn't tell. We know a lot of witch hunts happened and a lot of people were taken out, especially those that were progressing in rank probably more quickly than um, those that, that were their ma male counterparts, because we do know that Don't Ask, Don't Tell did significantly impact women um, more broadly than men. So can you tell us a little bit about, about serving in those early times, um, especially from 93 till, um, I guess, 2011? Uh, yeah, that's what the, the ban was. Yeah, yeah. so in my timeline, um, 25 years of my service were under some type of ban, whether that was the original policy or the don't ask, don't tell. I remember the 92, 93 time frame, and I was a, I was a captain at that time. And, and I'm trying to remember when you look back, it's like, how did I even know it was changing? Because, you know, it isn't, we didn't have all of this stuff coming to our phone. And, you know, I must have read it in the paper. I must have read about it in the Army Times. You know, I think that's probably how I kept up on my news about how the policy was changing at that particular time. Uh, but, you know, we knew and we were aware. And for me personally, in that 93, 94 time frame, as we are adjusting to this new reality that's don't ask, don't tell, is that I thought it was good. I thought it, I thought it was an improvement because in the previous policy, my mere existence was such an affront to good order and discipline, you know, that I couldn't even be near people in uniform um, because I, you know, I would be too disruptive if they knew who I was. And with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, you know, there was an acknowledgement um, by America, by, by the Department of Defense, that we did exist and that we were there. And people want to know that they exist. And so as horrible as in practice uh, that don't ask, don't tell law became and in the, in the very negative impacts they, it had over the 17 years that it was in place, for just a moment, it felt like we had made progress. And, and again, I look back now over that 35 years and in a way we did make progress. Um, in, it, it, it went off a little bit and didn't turn out the way perhaps the policymakers had intended it to and some of the negative outcomes. Um, but for, for a moment, it felt like an improvement. Yeah, so during that time too, I, um, I believe this was the timeline moving forward into the 2000, 20, 2010 and, and such. Then you fell in love and you, wanted, you got married pretty shortly after. I think Don't Ask, Don't Tell, is that correct? Or was it before? Or, um, and what was that like to, you know, 
to fall in love and, you know, want to be, you know, as, I mean, I know what it's like. I mean, or I just experienced that for, like, the first time, falling in love with the love of your life. So what, what was that like to, you know, almost have to hide it so much, uh, but want to be so happy and have her by your side? And um, because I know whenever I was in the military, we, I mean, it was just sometimes roommates and um, you would hope that, you know, for at least for me, like we made sure that there was a guest bedroom. So if anybody came over, we knew to place things. And if I, one time we, I lived in Ohio and I didn't want to really be out. And so we put an American flag out. So we, you know, so that they knew that, uh, that we were some type of patriot or patriotic and everything. So what was that like to fall in love and, um, you know, want to be so happy and not being able to be married or at least recognized by the Department of Defense um, till, till a little bit later? Well, you know, just when you look at that timeline, it's starting in the 80s and 90s. So my default position um, and this, in, my default position was the same as many of the people perhaps in this room and who are on the video. Your default position is to hide. And so that's the skill that you become really, really good at. And, you know, whether it was the initial policy where it was a criminal act or whether it was don't ask, don't tell, and it was going to be an administrative discharge, I mean, the whole success of your life was your ability to hide. And I know that that was, that was, that's my experience. That's the experience of people who were living in the military, such as I. But what was hard for me is that for most of that, it, there's this acceptance that, um, you know, kind of these are the rules of the road right now in the 80s and 90s is that, um, you know, a lot of America isn't okay with this. You know, the attitudes hadn't shifted yet. And those of us who chose to serve, such as you, we wanted to serve. We wanted to wear the uniform of our country. We, we wanted to be part of uh, defending this country, and that was very important to us. And many of us, I did, I rationalized that it was worth the hiding, and it was worth the stuff in the personalized away in order for the privilege uh, to wear that uniform. So I think that, you know, when you we think about how how did it work or how was it like, and this was probably your experience too, you you just know your default position is to hide. And so when public perceptions started to change, when more people were brave and came out, when more people knew somebody who was a member of the LGBT community, we saw that in America where our volunteer base comes from, you know, there started to be this shift in this conversation about what it meant to be a member of the LGBT community. And, um, and we began to not be so, we weren't the villains anymore. We were your next door neighbor who flew the American flag on their house, you know, and, and those things. So what it was like before the actual repeal is that in many ways it was harder than just simply hiding because you saw the potential. You saw people in society living a life that was full and authentic, that included your partner. You saw those things, and in, in, in many ways, that made it even harder to serve and to be in uniform during that time, because you knew the potential, and you knew, you, you knew that there was, there was nothing wrong with you, that it was a system, uh, that there was something wrong with the system, and so, for, for me personally, and maybe for many other people who experience this, it actually was harder as things begin to get better in society because you thought, well, why can't the Army get this? Why, why don't they get it? Exactly. That's definitely what I thought. It was really difficult whenever you just wanted somebody to be there with you at your promotion ceremony or um, that wasn't just your friend. <laughs> um, every, most people knew. I mean, I think as we changed, you know, during Don't Ask, Don't Tell them the Perception started to shift, especially that year after the implementation. And we were just waiting in, from 2010 to 11. So I know what some of, what, oh, the, what, what were you, what were some of your hiding techniques? Oh, my hiding techniques. Oh goodness, like the bedroom. I, we would always set up a separate bedroom uh, to make sure that nobody came in. I would always never use the pronouns of he or she. Um, I would always say they. Um, so for those struggling with. Uh, figuring out how to pronounce trans folks' pronouns. Uh, if you go in hiding, it's pretty easy then. Um, and I think that, um, I think for a lot of the community and for myself, I 
I think I was hyper um, feminine um, and tried to make sure that, you know, when I, people didn't see me as being gay or, and I think that's quite, that happens a lot, especially with masculinity. It's either hyper masculinity and what that looks like. But um, for the longest time, even until recently, I never even uh, had any, didn't want to fly a pride flag because it was so hard for me where I didn't want to like hold hands in public because it was very hard. Um, I think those were the hiding techniques that, you know, just not being open. And that, I mean, I, start, I started serving in much later. Um, in 2010 was my first year of service and I was investigated during that time. But after that, I think I was probably one of the last people I investigated, <laughs> thankfully. Um, but after that, I mean, I had a whole service career with being open and authentic. Um, and I think I still have, you know, kind of, um, for lack of a better word, some of the trauma that, you know, was associated with that, like knowing that, you know, I still have, still I have to check myself sometimes and say, oh, it's okay to hold hands, or we're, at, you know, we're at a military function, and it's okay to say this is my partner, or this is my fiance, or whomever, or this is my son, because even, I think, with families, um, it was, you know, really difficult, and that leads me to one of my other questions is, you were very active in you know, the family environment and you had one of the, I think it was one of the first calls to go and bring families into the White House. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that and what, like, what made you start that? Uh, what does that look, what did that look like for you? And, you know, really also what was the impact like that we are still seeing today? Yeah, it's, um, you know, when you jump ahead in, in the timeline to, to the repeal and uh, in, in 2011, I, and I can't believe it's been 10 years. It's just absolutely crazy to me that um, 10 years, the sky didn't fall. You know, people are people are serving. And, um, and it turned out the way that we always knew that it would be because we knew who we were. And, um, you know, what has really changed in the past 10 years, you know, from our personal perspective is that um, for one thing is that you would ask about like how is it hard to have a relationship and then hide it and you know it it was just part of what I did until I met Tracy <laughs> you know and then Tracy rocked my world and that's um you know that's what made it really hard because now the very best thing in your life that you want to share you can't share and so I feel like Tracy and I used then the 10 years without the policy in place kind of almost to make up for lost time um, and we made a decision. So um, those of you who may not be familiar with the, like the timeline of my own personal story is that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed in September of 2011. Um, I was in Afghanistan, um, came back from that. Tracy and I could now finally plan our wedding. We got married in March of 2012. And then in May of 2012, I had been notified that I had been selected for promotion to Brigadier General. And I mean, you remember, you were paying attention. You knew exactly who had come out among senior officers and all the services. I mean, we were paying attention to this sort of thing. And, um, and we knew that there hadn't yet been anybody be open at the rate, at the grade of 07 at Brigadier General or, as, or in the Navy as a flag officer. We knew there was no one. And so just by virtue of timing, it was the potential that when I got promoted, if Tracy participated in it, then, uh, you know, I would be the first openly gay general. And so the timing of that happened. And so I have been in this position of having a disproportionate platform. But what Tracy and I didn't know is like, I mean, you get promoted, you don't know how long it's going to last. You know, and here I'm, I'm at the end now of my career. Am I Am I going to, you know, have one job and be asked to retire or that sort of thing? We didn't know how long my career might be from that point on. So we jumped in with both feet and we did it together. And we did it from a perspective of this is what leaders do. And I mean, we had a conversation about it. it it's we felt that it was important that we being out and very senior in the Department of Defense, that we should know that even when we don't think people are watching, people are watching us. And if we give a role model that says, um, 
be ashamed of your family. Don't bring them to things. Don't have them participate in things. We knew then that we would be sending a signal that people needed to continue to hide. And that's not the culture that I wanted in the army that I was in. And so we worked together and bless her heart, she would, she would run herself ragged, helping me and supporting and going to work full time and then participating in army events in the evening and that sort of thing. So as we, we all know, if we've been at the, all the social things that you do and all the other, the uh, mandatory fun events and all of those sort of things. And, um, and we hit the ground running. I never had any idea when I started it that we would have the privilege of serving for almost 10 years in the general officer rank, uh, but we did. But we, like I say, we, we approached it with intention that if I was only going to have one tour as a general, then um, I was going to have a tour where my family was front and center, um, my life was authentic, and I was going to lead in a way that I had never had the opportunity to lead before, and that was the approach that we took after the, after the repeal came. That's amazing. I just think about, you know, 2012, I was probably a senior airman, so I was enlisted in the Air Force, and I, uh, it's interesting to be on this side now of things, but I remember in 20, 2011 and 2012, I mean, obviously when you came out, it was huge. Um, I was a part of the or one of the iterations of our organization called OutServe SLTN, which some people don't know this, but it was an organization that we it was very secretive. <laughs> I felt like every time you know you went, it was it was during the time of Facebook as a big platform. I mean, it still is for uh, for me as a millennial. <laughs> Um, but we had these groups that we would go in for Facebook and you had to get vetted and get vetted again and making and I was so scared all the time that you know that somebody from the Office of Special Investigations was on there or whatnot. So I mean it was a secret like the secret platform that we all had even after the repeal because I mean we were still there was a lot of us that were still scared. And so for me as just this little airman, I mean I remember looking up and being like, wow, there's somebody that looks like me that can achieve that. Um, I never thought I'd be a general officer. But, you know, just that to say it was, you know, just somebody in the military that... I didn't know. think I would be either. <laughs> so uh, just to say that, you know, I, it was phenomenal. And we still don't see that many, you know, out. I mean, we still, we see several, a couple, but there's not very many that are out and open that portray or live a life like you do and did during your service. Um, so... Just tell I me, mean, I just want to know more about, you know, your, you know, obviously what, you know, you said after you came out and served fully, did 10 years as a general officer, made it up to major general. Um, so what did that, you know, what did that look like on the, that, on the, the other end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell? What did that 10 years, you know, look like for you? Because um, I know, I mean, I know you did a lot of work <laughs> um, in our, in, you know, for, propelled our community in so many ways. Um, but also, I want to know how did you know we, as an officer, you know, as an out lesbian officer, if that's one thing, but also you're a woman, um, which is also difficult to advance in that rank, and you're in the army as well, so it's even, I feel like it's really difficult in that sense. So can you tell us a little bit about your both that experience and the intersections that overlay? Um, how how did you do it? How did you make it uh, in a world that's? I mean, I even knew in my career field we were intel, but I was I always worked for male generals always at, at Southcom. So just kind of what was it like to be a female in that and then um, even the layers of uh, intersectionality? Yeah, it's um, when a person is promoted, it, I mean, in, in the military, we all, we all know this, it, when you're promoted, uh, expectation of increased responsibility and broader scope of responsibility. And I always think of my promotion to Brigadier General, especially as I think of it as a martini glass, you know, if you look at the stem, you're just going along like that, and then all of a sudden, it goes just like that. And that is what it feels like to be promoted to Brigadier General in terms of the immediate change in your scope of responsibility and the breadth of things that you are responsible for. So um, I did that in um, the Pentagon as my first job. And so, you know, Maybe maybe it was easier there. I don't I don't know. Um, but you know, I wasn't in a line unit. I was um, in in a force at the time that I was starting. 
that was more diverse than would have been at, say, at maybe at Fort Carson or Fort Bliss or one of the other Army installations. And so I was able then to have my own women role models. I remember in the Army um, going to like one of the, your, your basic staff meetings with the Chief of Staff of the Army. It was all uniform. And on that day, I looked, and I think that there were four three-stars, three-star women at that table as part of a, as a routine of this. And so I was able to see that. Um, in terms of how did I lead with the intersection in, as a lesbian, I mean, I was, I, was, I was breaking glass as I went along. And um, because people had not seen this before, you look back and you realize, well, it wasn't that hard. We were just like living our life. You know, but at the, at the time when you're moving forward, because everything is new, I went through legal reviews for so many things that would be routine um, for um, a heterosexual couple. For example, uh, even at my promotion to Brigadier General, it was, um, well, in the script, do we refer to Tracy as the wife or the spouse or, do, or just the partner? Because if we say, spouse, then it might mean that the Army endorses the gay marriage and, you know, we don't, ha we don't have a position on the Defense of Marriage Act, so maybe we she should only be partner. And so we went through a, a lot of things, but what we did was, like I say, we just led with authenticity and tried to move through our life, living our life, and each time that we came to one of those potential barriers where somebody said, you can't do that uh, because it's political. There, there was, there was, that was part of it at the beginning, too, is that because groups get politicized, it doesn't mean I'm political. It, there's nothing partisan about who I am. I just am who I am. Uh, but much of the initial resistance had to do with because it related to the gay and lesbian community, it must be political. And, you know, and the, we were able to do a lot of educating to Army policymakers about, no, it's just us living our life. Um, one of the best things that happened to us with all these policy changes, and it, it's incredible, and it's something that many military families simply take for granted, is that one of our best experiences was that after the Defense of Marriage Act um, was ruled unconstitutional and we were allowed to recognize our spouses and the Department of Defense recognized them, as I said to Tracy, I said, you know, we can live on an army post now. We can live in like one of those army houses. And um, she was like, okay, let's go do it. And we, for the very first, I had never lived on an army post because I had to hide. You know, there was no way that I was even in a bachelor officer's quarter. There was no way I was gonna live on an army post and, and have somebody perhaps notice my coming and going or anybody that I might be hanging out with. So I had never lived on a post and we moved into family quarters and it was, it, it, when I look back on what are the most positive experiences of my military career, being in those military communities on an army post, people do not, whoever you are, do not take that for granted. If you have that, if you have access to that, please take advantage of that. It's, it's unlike any other neighborhood in the world. Yeah, exactly. And that's one thing that, you know, I, during my time of service, I wasn't married or anything. So I wish that I would, I would have experienced that. Because, I mean, I just think about it. We don't. Those are the things we really don't think about whenever it comes to like policies and um, which we should because we're all those. Um, my other, well, I've got many other questions. I could just go on and on. But my other one, my next one is um, like how, what is, what is the importance of being able to live openly and authentically in you? Um, I, I know for me it changed my leadership because it made me, you know, as in the Air Force we have core values as other service branches do and one of them was integrity. And I felt during my service I couldn't, uphold that core value because um, I was not lying, but not 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 lying <laughs> and not showing integrity. So so what is it, whatever, in whatever circumstance, it doesn't just have to be your identity as LGBTQ, but what does it mean to, you know, be authentic and open and yourself in service and even when, even just in society in general? And, you know, I would, before talking about the, um, authenticity that you feel, you know, we'll go back to two tangible things that were really important. Um, the first one being that with Don't Ask, Don't Tell in place, um, women had a higher probability of sexual harassment or assault because they could be outed if they either didn't go along or if, if they told and reported that. 
And, um, and I mean, that was, that's just the truth. And so um, the repeal allowed then for, for women to identify as they were and say, I'm not interested for one thing, you know, they, they didn't have to do this dance of pretend. And, um, and then it took away that the reprisal of outing. Uh, that was that was very very common under don't ask don't tell especially the disproportionate number of women it had to do with that as being outed as a reprisal uh, for not accepting an advance the other real change also is that there was initially the thought that we were a threat to our national security of uh, just by simply who we are and really the threat was because we had to hide who we were you know we could be um, more or higher propensity of, of being blackmailed because somebody was going to out us, you know, for in, in our national security roles. I mean, so those two tangible things just got improved um, with the repeal. The other part of it, the authenticity, is you don't realize how much you refer to your family um, when you, unless you can't refer to them at all. And our, and our military, of course, puts so much um, emphasis on the role of family support and taking care of families. And if you retain the family, you'll retain the soldier, you know, all of those sort of things. And um, allowing families like mine to exist, because we did exist before, we were just simply hiding, we were always there. But allowing our families to exist and exist in a way that allows them also to have the support structures and provide us the support structures, it, it gave us, it took some weight off of us that allowed us then to be even more focused on, on our leadership, not that we weren't before, um, but to, to do that in such an authentic way. Yeah, I can, for, for, I totally concur with everything you just said. I mean, the security clearance, that was one of my biggest worries because I did intel. Um, and I personally, because of, uh, because of them not being, you couldn't be open and authentic, and I was, uh, unfortunately, a survivor of sexual violence in the military. That's actually what happened, is that I was, I reported it, and they came back and said I was gay. And so that's how the investigation started into me. So it was the unintended consequences of a policy, um, which is why I'm here where I am today, uh, because of my passion to make sure that we do the right thing uh, moving forward. But um, I know you have Dixon's book in your hand. Um, and we know since, you know, the first service member ever discharged from the military was during the Revolutionary War. He was drummed out of the camp, which I kind of find is uh, not comical, but kind of in its, in its own way. Uh, sometimes I wish we kind of could do that. We could have done that today. Like, not today, but like whenever anybody was outed, we could have this big pride celebration for them. Uh, but um, also we know that from World War II until the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, 114,000 service members were discharged dishonorably other than honorable and they still have no benefits. So I know that his book you know, highlights the fact that just during the time of 1993, um, he started service, uh, defense legal, or service Member Legal Defense Network, and that is also the first iteration of our organization as the Modern Military Association. Um, I was able to sit down, well, not really sit down, but on, we were able to talk about the first, um, him coming up with the idea to make sure that equity and access was given to everyone and so I know that you brought that for a reason. So I wanted to give you time to share, you know, especially his work and his new book that just came out and give him a plug. Yeah, I just, uh, I brought it, just give him a plug is, it's, is those of, who are interested in, in what Don't Ask, Don't Tell was like. Um, his book, Mission Possible, uh, what he does such a great job is, one, he was there. I mean, he was, he was literally in the trenches fighting the fight on our behalf. And um, he and he and the other folks associated um, with the Service Member Legal Defense Network, but what he does so well is that he gives you individual stories that show the unintended consequences, as, as you outline, of the policy. And, and it's a, from a, like, when you recommend leadership books for officers to read, you know, if you want to understand how influencing policy works, um, then this is a good example of how, even without changes in law, how you can have a significant positive or negative impact uh, on the force by how you can influence policy change with the, within the building. And if you are a leader and you're listening to this in the military and you want this book, please contact the Modern Military and we'll make sure that it gets in your hands. We're trying to put it at every, uh, at a lot of libraries and within the DOD and to make sure that the history is 
being able to be accessible and read and that people actually know what happened. So I think we kind of since 93 and then they, everybody thinks that it, all, it got magically better in 2011. And we know that, you know, still within the DOD, DHS and the VA, they still have never collected data on LGBTQ folks. Um, and this, you know, the only way we know that there's 114 was because of the census data, which doesn't really tell the true picture of really our community. And so um, one of my questions is, you just retired in 2011, or 2011, 2021. The pandemic takes a lot of, way, a lot of years away. Um, but uh, what is on your horizon? What's next? Uh, what, what are you going to do? I know that you became certified, I think certified, or at least got a course with, for bartending, which I'm super excited to see one day. Um, but what's, what's coming up for you? Well, Tracy and I, we, we're very purposely taking what we call our gap year. And, uh, and you know, after, after 35 years, I, I, was, I was tired. You know, I hit my mandatory retirement date at 35 years. And, um, and so, we, we, as always, we talked about it. And then I said, you know, I'd like to just take a gap year. Let's kind of reset. Let's travel. Let's, let's do some things. Um, so, you know, I always see my future. I have been so... Um, deeply impacted by my experience um, more than I had realized and now my head has got time to think about it and so I'm I will always be a strong advocate for um, workplace inclusion um, for a culture that is accepting of just whoever you are um, you know with of course preference of, of helping out the LGBTQ community um, but I think that that when our gap year is over, I will find myself still leaning towards those type of opportunities and uh, that sort of work. Because um, even with the iterative progress that I've seen over my lifetime, we still, I mean, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And, and there need to be people like you and your organizations ensuring that we don't backslide uh, on the progress that has been made. Yeah, one of the things you mentioned earlier was, you know, that Don't Ask, Don't Tell just simply covered lesbian, gay, and bisexual folks. You know, it's, it simply left off trans folks. So we saw whenever a new presidential administration came, although trans folks could serve openly, an executive order struck that down. Um, we do know that there's, you know, we've got to go to, we've got to have that code of, or codified into law. And for some folks that don't know, there's also a ban on people living with HIV that can't serve, even if they are have undetectable. Um, a stereocytis load, I believe that's the term. And we also know that, you know, even people who are intersex can't serve either. So, um, and the outlook for non-binary and gender diverse and gender non-conforming is on the horizon. Um, and, you know, I guess I just wanna, you know, I know we are, we're coming to an end here. I know we got like a little, a little bit more, but I mean, what other things did we miss? What things do you, you know, is there anything that you wanna say that we didn't, I didn't ask you or, you know, we're like nuggets that you like to leave um, for folks. Yeah, the um, in, in, we've got a few minutes left. Maybe um, I don't know if any questions came in on the chat too, from spurred by a few things we said. You know, it's um, I I think that we need to be looking over the horizon as a Department of Defense, as as people who do workforce planning, is that when you look at how young people identify these days, because they just know more about the world and. And to be gender non-conforming or non-binary is just becoming more natural to the exact same population for which we would like to bring their talents into uniform. But we don't know how to do that, as, as you say, with some, with some groups, depending on how they identify and their gender and, and just, just um, whoever they are. You know, it doesn't, it's not open to, uh, to uh, everyone. So I think that we need to just think about that and not pretend like it's not going to happen. And just to educate ourselves and to to interact with the people who are already doing that work, uh, so that when we look ahead to what our recruiting is going to look like, we are leaving talent on the table that's going off to corporate America that we could have had uh, in our ranks only because we have not kept up um, with with how people identify for themselves. So I think that there is some place to look over the horizon on on that particular topic, and then also just. The, the role of leader visibility, um, you know, we will, we will not backslide if our leaders 
are willing to speak up as allies of whatever community it is uh, that needs the boost. Do you, and uh, we often talk about this is that if you are an ally, whether if you're ally to um, the LGBT community, whether you're ally for women, whether you're an ally based on um, a racial group that you're trying to support, um, it's not enough to be neutral. Is that just that you're a good guy or gal doesn't mean that the marginalized group that you were thinking that you're an ally for knows that. So you have to you have to move beyond neutral. And I think that that our leaders have gone beyond neutral in in their actual what they believe about leadership. But they they've got to speak up. They've got to show that they are allies. Uh, they have got to say out loud that an inclusive environment is the environment uh, that will win wars uh, because we'll bring the best ideas to the table. Yeah, I do agree. Allies are one of the most important things. I mean, we saw that during the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell with Honorable Patrick Murphy stepping up and um, you know being an ally and basically losing a seat later on because of that. Um, there are so many people I know that in my career that were such good allies that I look back and I'm like, they gave me opportunities that, you know, despite, you know, um, of who I was, that, you know, they had an open mind, even though sometimes uh, they probably wouldn't have politically agreed, um, but they were really great people. So before we get to any other questions, I do want to ask, since we're at the Women's Memorial, the Military Women's Memorial, uh, is there a military female leader that you look up to or uh, that, you know, that you remember in your time that just sticks with you? You know, I'm, it, when I came through, there were just so many fewer of them. Um, and, and so it wasn't actually until I was almost a field grade officer that I had routine interaction. But one that sticks out is a member of our community, and uh, that's Greta Kamenweyer. And uh, Greta Kamenweyer was a colonel who um, ended up outing herself on her security clearance process because she needed a security clearance to attend the Army War College because she needed that because she was on a path to become a general. And uh, she, was, she was that good. And so she got a line to go to the Army War College, but she outed herself in her security clearance because of her integrity. And that started an investigation. And this happened back in the early 90s. And so the impression that that left on me, that she fought that, and she eventually won and was reinstated. She never got to complete the war college and you know, she never moved beyond um, a, uh, a colonel, um, even though she's perfectly capable of doing that. Uh, but I will always remember her and look up to her because of her, uh, her willingness to lead with visibility you know, at that time when that opportunity presented itself. She didn't, she didn't sulk away. She didn't hide. She didn't say, I shouldn't make a ruckus about this. She said, no, this is wrong in my case, and, and I need to be visible uh, on, on my own behalf. And then it trickled down to people like me. Yes, yeah, she, she's definitely inspirational for us. She's a member of the Modern Military Association of America. She just, uh, I think last year, came out with a new documentary about her story and them um, serving which I think it's serving in silence or, or something of that matter. But it's a great documentary that, you know, t timelines her life and her experience. And I think, you know, it's for me as being having served under Donessa and Tell and just being a part of this, you know, evolution of inclusion, I think reading the stories and the histories of, you know, the, the struggles that people had to go through, uh, because I wouldn't be doing this job without folks like you um, folks like that are act, that have been activists for so many years. Um, sometimes I sit in these calls, like we were on a call together not too long ago, and it was just an honor that you know all these people didn't know me, um, didn't know my experience, but they they knew that there was somebody coming behind them that it would impact so much. And so I am grateful for you for you know always standing up and making that decision to be open. And for folks that were, you know, that we know that served in silence, we know that they did and never got to be open and um, authentic. And, you know, just for everyone that, you know, was an ally or an advocate or just was there to like sometimes push the bill because uh, sometimes we don't know who actually write, write some of the bills and how they get passed. But there are people that are allies there. So I just want to say thank you. It was, uh, you had no idea that, you know, what you did um, impacted my life and my family. 
um, and even just the progress of our community. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. It, it, it's it's been a privilege. Uh, Bill Jean King, her book Pressure is mm -hmm. a privilege, and um, you know it has been a privilege to be in this position. And then two is I, I'd be remiss as you mentioned those who served in silence and those that we don't even know about, and those who took their dinner dishonorable discharge and then left with the shame mm -hmm. that we put on them is that you know I am retired now but still a senior officer and I would if they were if they're on the call if they were in the room I would look them in the eye and remind them that regardless of how the Department of Defense characterized your discharge just just for being gay is that your service is and was as honorable as any other service members that you you served with dignity, you stepped up when your country needed you, and um, and I recognize that, and we recognize that. So um, I know there's nothing that we can do that can take back the harm. I mean, there are things happening now that that help, um, but but they served with as much honor as mm -hmm. any other service member. Yes, in our organization, if you do have one of those discharges, please contact us. Legal at Modern Military, we assist pro bono of upgrading those discharges. The process isn't perfect. It takes probably two to two to five years, sometimes even longer. But we're trying to work and make it easier. And uh, just last week, the VA came out and said, if you've been other than honorable discharge under the characteristics of uh, or the characterization, excuse me, of homosexual conduct or homosexuality, you your VA benefits can be restored. So please reach out to us. Um, and like General Smith said, your your service, it matters. You matter. Um, and, you know, you should be sir, showed that it, you have dignity and respect that we need to recognize. And I hope that every day that our work that we do at our organization and the continued work of our um, advocates and allies uh, pushes the effort so that this never happens again. And then we do right the, the wrongs of that. And so... Um, I think we can open it up to questions if anybody has any from the audience, or I don't know if anybody has any online. We did get a few online, uh, so I'll go ahead and start with that one. The first that we got was, what drove you to continue to serve um, despite policies like don't ask, don't tell that were actively working against you? What drove you to keep, keep serving with that? You know, you stay for different reasons than you join. You know, I, I joined, it was an economic decision. I had a ROTC scholarship and I was gonna have a job when I graduated from college and I wouldn't have to go back and live at my parents' house. And, um, but, so the reasons you join are different than the reasons you stay. And I stayed because I found myself to be around people with the same values that I had in an institution that was honorable for what we did for our nation. And for me, the reason I chose to stay is because I liked being around people with values and character. And I liked being in, in an institution uh, that played, that was a profession uh, that had standards and had a place in our society that was unique and elevated in a sense than other things I could have done. And so I stayed for that reason. At the time, the trade-off was worth it. You know, I, I don't, I don't know. You, you made the decision to come in in like 2009, 2010, um, and when I joined, it was wherever you, wherever I had worked, it was we weren't welcome. You know, and yours was a different um, decision to go through there. But, um, but I would have to imagine for most people, it is that you, you join for a reason, and then you realize that you found yourself around people who are like you. Yeah, and then just. Juxtaposed to that, I served in 2010. I see, still at my desk have the paper that says if you were found to be homosexual, you'd be discharged. I leave that there, so I'm reminded every day that, you know, of the, of the work I do. And you know, I served my six years, and I decided to get out um, and go to school um, and pursue, you know, higher, more higher education. And you know, I never thought that I'd be in this place, but I think it's been really interesting for me because. I was this little airman that I, you know, I was a e, I ended up finishing in, as an E5, which is a staff sergeant. And then I get to go into the VA now in my job and say, look, these are some of the policies that we need to change. And 
it's for me, it's kind of surreal. My impact was much better served on the on the outside of the military than on the inside, and uh, and I would never, you know, all my troops, you know, I never dissuade them from leaving or staying. I wanted to make sure that they did whatever they needed to for them. And for me, it was for joining. It was, you know, I wanted to do something bigger. But I also came from a very small town. There was my parent. I was a first generation college student. I didn't have money to go to college. I wish I would have known about ROTC because I would have done that. But uh, I didn't have the cultural capital or social capital back then either. Um, but, you know, for me, you know, your service meant so much within the military. Um, and for, for me, then my service has much, I mean, your service is also going to be matter on the other side too, but um, my service was is more fulfilling on the outside. So I think that's uh, one of the reasons that I decided to to stop my uh, service commitment too. So a little juxtaposition of that. You know, they said they had a couple that came in, so. Sure, so then the next one that we got was, um, you, you talked a little bit about kind of, um, uh, hiding while you were in the military. How long did it take to adjust to not having to use such rigorous hiding techniques in your uh, personal and in your professional life? That, that's, that is such a great question, and Tracy had to live through it with me. It's, um, you really build in, and those of you who have experienced this know, you build in this muscle memory of, um, of it's just reflexive. Your hiding is reflexive. When Tracy and I met in 2004, so we were together um, long before the repeal, and it was reflexive that we knew that if we were in the grocery store and somebody said, hey, ma'am, she knew it was a military person knowing me, and she would just walk off like she didn't know me, and we would meet back at the car you know, later. And so you have these habits that you do, and I would have to say that it took me... Um, three or four years to like undo many of just the reflexive habits uh, that came with hiding to, I had the hardest time just introducing Tracy in an event. And, you know, I, my hands would practically shake if I would introduce her as my wife, you know, and, and use, use that particular language. So um, what I learned from this experience and what, many people who have gone through that from that hiding whatever it is and we're talking about the military i know school teachers have had a similar experience and there's been other professions that have gone through this is that i just now have a better understanding that being honest is just the first step but there's some work that has to be done between honest and authentic so just because you've taken that first step to be honest i mean there's still some muscle tissue that has to be broken up um, in order for you to actually move into the behaviors that is your authentic self and be patient with yourself as you move through them. But I'm thinking for me, and I'll have Tracy nod her head or not, but I'm thinking it took me, you know, three or four years uh, before I got to that place where it just felt like that was my new muscle memory. And I mean, I served just a short period of time, but I think that that, I also was in a relationship where we hid, we continued to hide. She was a professor and um, didn't want, we also lived in Ohio, um, Dayton, Ohio, which is very conservative. So uh, she wanted to go through ten, the tenure process. So she didn't want to become outed from her students. And also she just, you know, she was a, quite a bit older than me. So it was really hard for her to really um, be open and authentic. So I had it on, like, not only on the side of the military, but also on my partner. So um, undoing that has taken me up until this year, actually, is to be open and authentic. Even being the executive director and CEO of the organization, it's been the first year I've actually flown a pride flag and been, um, so not everybody's journey is, you know, and it was kind of funny, even whenever same-sex marriage, um, or as Edie Windsor would say, marriage, um, was uh, legal, no, I had a lot of people that were like, are you just going to go get married? I'm like, no, I'm not. Um, but, you know, having that pride, it, it's taken me a, a long journey, and I think it was definitely because of my early roots in the military, of a lot of hiding, and then hiding within, you know, the community of where I was living. I think I'm finally at a place where, you know, it's, it's exciting, and it's pretty liberating for me, and uh, to be open, and um, even, I mean, you were there last week, I got to propose to my to my partner, 
um, in front of everyone, which was super exciting. And it was like one of the first times that I'd ever been open in front of the, that many people and just showed the love and, and care of being part of the, the LGBT community. All right. Uh, we also have, um, you, you mentioned um, the, the one book already, but we also um, just wanted to ask if there are any additional books or resources that you'd recommend for individuals uh, looking for stories that relate um, to service members, uh, LGBTQ service members, or being a better ally um, to the community. Yeah, there, there have been, fortunately, lots of books written about people's experiences um, going through the military and, um, and through their personal experiences uh, just coming out. Um, so Mission Possible takes you from the start of Don't Ask, Don't Tell until it's repeal. The, prior to that, the go-to book is Randy Stiltz is his name, and Tracy helped me with the Conduct and Becoming. And so that is one that traces personal stories um, from uh, World War II up until the, um, until the start of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, there was another one that, that um, Nathaniel Frank wrote um, that was in support of repeal that came out. It was, um, I'll blurt it when I think of it, but, but yes, there are, there are several titles that, that cover time periods and, and lots of memoirs. Uh, that have been put out there. Um, the original OutServe member, um, J.D. Smith, he also has a compilation of uh, just stories of people um, relaying their experiences. So, though, but the, like I say, the definitive is probably that Randy Stoltz book uh, that is out there. And we know there's one that's called Serving Under Fire. I think it coming out under fire. Yeah, coming out yeah. under fire. It, it's I think from World War One and Two, I believe. Um, also, one of my personal friends named Dr. To Dr. Bussey, they are in the process of finishing their book, and they will. It's published on Donuts Hotel, and I think previous policies. He's a, or, excuse me, they are a historian, um, and so I'm really excited to read their book uh, that's coming out. And he's a professor at, or they are, excuse me, they are a professor at Kenyon College, um, and they work really closely with our organization. But really excited to see that you know there's more interest in uncovering the hidden histories and uncovering the commonalities. We also just put out a magazine in our, on our website that highlighted, I think, about 10 personal stories about what Don't Ask, Don't Tell means. Um, uh, also, Representative Giacano is also doing um, video monologues of folks who were um, harmed under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So there's like, there is quite a bit that are, that's coming out um, detailing we can't wait till your book comes out. I don't know when that's going to be, but uh, if you're ever going to write one, but I would love to read it for sure. But it does, you know, and, and I know we're coming to our time where we come into a close, though. I mean, but that's really, we talked about, like, what's over the horizon, and we focus a lot on, like, what our experience was moving through this. But but really, that that we have to help people understand about all the goodness that has come since the repeal and how our lives changed and how our leadership changed and how opportunities for families changed and how people became more open not only to their soldiers but to members of their own family and now could accept members of their own family because they learned about this stuff while they were in the service. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there has been so many good and positive things that have come from repeal. And I, I know I do, do this, and it's sometimes I, I think more about like the first 25 years than that last 10, but that last 10 is where my real power has been. Yeah, I, we also have seen, especially the shift, and and not only in our society and culture, but we've seen other military service organizations and veteran service organizations come out and support. I mean, there's it's pretty phenomenal to see, you know, some of the most conservative organizations uh, 10 years ago said we are not we do not want anything to do with the repeal of Donas Hotel they're you know not they're supposed to be part of the, the military and then 10 years later we see that they you know repost one of our posts or they collaborate with us or um, it's just really interesting to see the progress that's occurred um, and know that there is so much more not only on the LGBTQ front but we know you know racial equity is a huge issue um, and gender, you know, making sure that the women can serve openly and 
there's just so much on the horizon, but I think that we're finally at a place, at least I hope, I want to say the hope, uh, that we are seeing some really positive changes. There's really good leaders that are in place right now in all areas, I believe, um, that do, that have the courage to stand up and do things. And we're also seeing corporate America for the first time um, kind of buck back on some policies in states. Um, we, one example is in Georgia, we saw a great, um, you know, great force from corporate America saying, you know, voting rights should be restored. Uh, so it's, a, it's just a different game, but we're seeing it played out um, for the betterment of society. And I think that's uh, so empowering for me and also for the next generation to come, whether they're serving in the military or not, you know. Um, but that's one thing that you know, I saw the progress personally, and I'm really excited about the future of uh, all the initiatives. I think based on the clock, we probably need to turn it over to the memorial again. I want to thank you both so much for this wonderful program today. It has been wonderful hearing um, from both of you on this great topic. And thank you all for, for joining us today here at the Military Women's Memorial and online. I know we have quite a few viewers there. Um, to catch some of our other programs, do check out our website, www.womensmemorial.org. And we welcome you to keep joining us here at the memorial until mid-November. When we do close for a little while, we're doing some, some renovations um, until uh, early next year. So stay tuned for, for future things to come. And thank you guys again so much.